thank you to the organizers for the challenge of interpreting a non-linear journey. And thanks to all of you here who are embarking on these journeys in a vicarious, perhaps even voyeuristic way. That's right, I just suggested all of you are voyeurs. The term voyeur, what does that mean to you? A peeping Tom, a pervert, someone who gets excited by watching others engaged in sexual activity. The term voyeur has negative connotations, so if and when we realize that voyeuristic tendencies underlie our actions and interests, there can be a lot of discomfort. And that's what I want to talk about, Voy voyeurism. The broader cultural voyeur who may be lurking within you. I'll start with my personal experience with academic voyeurism to show how voyeuristic tendencies can underlie our personal and professional pursuits and then finish with some thoughts on how we can mitigate its exploitative potential. So let's start with some definitions. Back in 1993, the African-American sociologist Patricia Hill Collins wrote about oppression. She writes that voyeurism is how the privileged look at the less privileged for entertainment and as interesting situations without actually helping. A rich person might question a poor person about their quality of life with no intent of actually helping that person. She then goes one step further to argue that academics can go one step farther and that those above the less privileged can actually see their subordinates as subordinates to them and exploit them for personal gain. What Hill Collins was describing sounds to me like many academic research projects. Or put another way, the linear path of an academic research project. University researchers occupy a privileged position in which we can ask questions about things that intrigue us and then spend time studying other people. When we submit proposals to taxpayer-funded research grant agencies, we highlight the salience of our work, its potential to influence public policy. Rarely do we admit to wanting to peer into the intimate lives of other people to satisfy our own curiosity. Academics don't necessarily help their research participants. University ethics review boards approve our methods. They don't require that the research participants themselves are actually helped. In fact, some scholars would argue that helping participants can invalidate and bias the research process. Academic researchers use their research for professional gain and, by extension, their research participants. Results are written in academic jargon. They're published in highly specialized academic journals that aren't particularly accessible to the research participants, the general public, or even the policy makers who could make use of this work. This is how academic voyeurism operates in the linear research path. The benefits are primarily accrued to the researcher, even the ones with the best of intentions and the most ethical of research protocols. When I started my, TA, my PhD, I embarked on a linear research path. That is, you start with finding a general topic, do a literature review to find out what other scholars think about your topics, come up with a reasonable research plan that allows you to answer your key questions, carry out your plan by studying other people or social phen phenomenon at your study site, and then write up and share the results. It was at the carry out your plan stage when my work veered off the linear path, and it became apparent I was flirting with academic voyeurism. Let me explain. I study environmental migration, or the mobility of people that somehow link to environmental factors like climate change or natural hazards. My PhD focused on what happens to the survivors of a so-called natural disaster. My study site was a city in the Philippines called Cagayan de, de Oro that had recently been devastated by Typhoon Sendong. I worked with 
urban poor sur survivors living in the slums and the organizations who helped them. Some of the methods I used included in-depth in interviews at people's old and new homes and in their work sites. These interviews lasted between 30 minutes to a full day. Two, non-participant observation in which I observed day, day, daily life in the transitional and permanent re, re, relocation housing sites, as well as the special events such as mass weddings and baptisms. And three, participatory video in which I brought survivors to all the different sites around the city that had been important to them in rebuilding their lives post-disaster, and then having them be filmed in recounting their experiences there. I worked with marginalized survivors like Bonnie. Pre-disaster, she lived in a slum on a sandbar in the Cagayan River with her husband and six-year-old son. All three survived the typhoon, but their home was destroyed. In the year following the typhoon, she lived in three different evacuation camps, one government safe house, one transitional housing site, and one permanent re resettlement site. At her second evacuation camp, state authorities observed her husband beating her. To protect her, the camp manager removed her from her husband and son, first transferring her to a government safe house, and then to a third evacuation camp. Instead of experiencing enhanced security, she had harrowing experiences there, where the other evacuees wrongly assumed that she'd been transferred because she'd done something wrong. At this third site, she describes the place. I had a lot of negative experiences here. I don't want to cause any trouble, but my fellow evacuees check inside my tent and gossip and insult me, calling me names and suspect me of being a monster. There was this one time when they took my urinal and placed it in the middle of the camp for everyone to see. Somebody told everyone that, hey, this is the urinal of Bonnie that is very yellow and very dirty. Look, she did not even clean it. I just endured everything they did to me, despite the pain I felt. Bonnie's mistreatment was further exacerbated by her appearance. She was presumed to belong to an indigenous tribe, and as such, she was subjected to the widespread pre prejudices against indigenous peoples in the, in the Philippines. My research entailed asking marginalized participants to expose their very emotionally charged and very intimate experiences. Participants were very generous with their time and their insights. I did not offer any individual benefits apart from transportation, food, and a thank you note. I, on the other hand, eventually earned a PhD through interpreting their contributions. It's not that I didn't want to help, I did the best I could with limited grad student resources, but there's only so much I could realistically do to reciprocate their, their generosity. There was a moment during that field season when I realized I was flirting with academic voyeurism. December 3rd, 2012 to be exact. You see, I was not the archetypal grad student researcher setting off alone to do research in a culture foreign to me. No, I was a young first-time mom traveling with my husband, Frank, and our then three-month-old daughter, a Ada. And this is how I describe the moment in my research blog. I have a confession to make. When I decided to study environmental migration for my PhD, I only wanted to study other people's experiences and not to experience it myself. Perhaps this desire makes me culpable of academic voyeurism. 12.35 p.m., I'm lying on a dorm bed, ironically in the very same hotel I visited last week, asking to speak with management about their Typhoon Sandong experiences. Frank and I talked a lot about what to do, looked up every weather website we, we could find, discussed the hazards most likely to affect us, Typhoon, storm surge, floods. 
debated which details to divulge to our families and when to share them. Frank cooked supper while I packed our evacuation bags. He made pad thai with lemongrass and okra. It felt like our final supper. Before putting Ada to bed, I played with her, read Eric Carley's stories, sang songs, and cuddled. It felt like some cheesy disaster film. Young foreign couple with a baby travels to an exotic tropical country where they succumb to some inevitable misfortune. The penultimate scene before the calamity strikes captures a slice of a happy family routine. The main event should hit around 2 p.m. It's raining harder now. There are big gusts of wind. The girls I saw playing baseball on a first floor porch this, this morning have left. The occasional cab drives by. Otherwise, the streets are eerily deserted. Corrugated sheet iron roofs threaten to cave in. Papaya trees bend. We wait. There's nothing we can do at this point except pray and write and wait. The knot in my stomach is gone. It was there yesterday afternoon and evening and night. Last night was long. We drove from hotel to hotel to hotel. They were full, full, full. Finally, one with an empty dorm room. It was after midnight when we checked in. Ada was wired. I was exhausted. Frank paced the halls with her, brought her outside to the fire escape, but the city lights only revved her up more. Not much sleep was had by anyone that night. Our friend April was constantly on her mobile, checking in with her husband, father, and hired help who stayed at the compound. 3 p.m. It's still raining, a constant, steady downpour. The eye of the storm has passed us, along with its strong winds. It's not the super typhoon that has April on edge. It's the rain in the mountains of neighboring Bu Kidnon province. The mountains are the water catchment area for the rivers and creeks of, of Tablon, where we live, as well as the tributaries feeding into the Cagayan River. 6.20 p.m. Normalcy returns with surprising speed. Street lights switch on. Karaoke microphones crackle. Reflecting upon my response to the typhoon and my newfound empathy for Bonnie was my aha moment of veering off the linear path. It's elicited a lot of thinking about academic voyeurism, how we conduct research, and voyeurism beyond academia. As I pointed out at the start of my talk, there's a good chance that many of you are here today because of voyeuristic tendencies lurking within you. You might be motivated by what Osai Appiah calls cultural voyeurism, the process by which mediated experiences provide a window into a culture that would otherwise be difficult for the voyeur to access. It is a deliberate, recurrent, and proactive effort to acquire information about another culture, sometimes from a distance, and sometimes as a participant observer. According to Appia, cultural voyeurism stems from a curiosity fostered by both positive and negative group-based stereotypes. It's driven by four factors. Self-expansion, personal distinctiveness, identification with aspirational groups, and a desire to be cool or hip. Do any of these factors ring true for you? Note that in Appiah's framing, there's no, necessary, there's no necessary link with oppression. Is this definition then just an attempt to whitewash what we're doing when we follow certain social media feeds, when we watch reality TV, when we tour the favelas of Rio, the slums of Mumbai, or the red light districts of western cities? Perhaps. But it also points to a way that voyeurism can be done without exploitation and instead lead to greater cross-cultural un understanding. So what are some tools to ensure that our voyeurism, the voyeuristic tendencies in our personal and professional pursuits, are more aligned with Appiah's cultural voyeurism and less with Hill Collins' oppressive one? One is to check your privilege, or as Guardian columnist Gabby Hensliff writes, quote, recognize that you've been lucky in ways it would be churlish to ignore, that consequently it pays to shut up and listen, 
that truths each of us consider to be self-evident may look very different from another perspective. Recall Bonnie and my typhoon experiences. I had access to a private car trying to find a, a hotel. I had a credit card to pay for the room. These privileges don't invalidate my experience or, or somehow diminish the fear I felt. But in checking my privilege, I'm better able to empathize with, with Bonnie. Two, think about your motivations and the potential repercussions of your actions. Some of my motivations were selfish. I'm fascinated by environmental my migration. I wanted to pursue a doctorate and to do overseas fieldwork. Other motivations were more altruistic. Building a more just and equitable society is important to me. I wanted to better understand disasters so that relief groups can use the research to provide more helpful and more inclusive responses. Three, carefully consider whether or not to engage with people in other cultures and situations. For me, this entails asking a question like, how would disaster relief be different if nobody studied the lives of, mar of marginalized survivors? And four, if you do opt to engage, then be deliberate in acquiring information that leads to meaningful interactions that will increase the empathy and cross-cultural un understanding. For example, I held a result-sharing workshop with government officials, typhoon survivors, local researchers, and others. Afterwards, government managers told me that they'd been unaware of the discriminatory practices embedded in their disaster relief policies and programs, that their critiques came from an outsider, a voyeur, meant they could use the research results to advocate within their agencies to create more inclusive evacuation camps without jeopardizing their jobs. I've struggled with these ideas and come to the conclusion that good, critical, and thoughtful academic research is essential and justified. And that's what I continue to do cross-cultural work. The truth is that many of us are voyeurs be it as academic researchers, uh, cultural tourists, or followers of certain Twitter feeds. So please don't feel disheartened wondering whether you should ever travel or do research in a cultural milieu different from your own. Instead, use your privilege to be a voyeur, to build empathy and create safer spaces for people like, like Bonnie. Thank you.